15,000 years ago in southeast Alaska, there was no inside passage. A thick, solid glacial mass covered the land like a coffin lid. This was the twilight of the Ice Age. In time, the glaciers fell back. Land was freed. Bursts of ocean rushed headlong to fill the inlets. Rimmed by mountains and canopied by low hanging mists, rainforests grew skyward along the coasts. Hemlock and spruce, emerald ferns and velvet mosses, the Inside Passage, a special place in the vastness of Alaska, a jewel in the giant. The great land is what Alaska means, an offspring of hot volcanoes and glacial ice. In Alaska's thinly populated vastness, the Inside Passage is a slender jewel. Known as the Panhandle, it graces the state's southeastern corner. Some 10 millennia in the past, a land bridge joined the farthest reaches of northern Asia to an outcrop of North America, an ice-free footpath for human beings, fearless folk of strong Asian stock. Future generations settled these coastlands and became the people of the totem. Tsarist Russians came and hacked out a new world empire. What the Russians pioneered, the United States purchased with dollars and metamorphosized as an albatross, gold field, territory, and at last, the 49th state. What we call the Inside Passage is a waterway for cruise ships with sharp-eyed skippers weaving their vessels past slumbering glaciers and myriads of tiny icebergs. Through misty fjords, the planet's perfect fjordal system. To catch a can, gateway city to the state, a safe keep town for the culture of the coastal Indians. To Sitka, once the Paris of the Pacific and capital of Russian America. As welcoming as a Scandinavian Christmas Eve is Petersburg, Alaska's little Norway. Now that Wrangell's rubbed the gold dust out of its eyes, it's a lively town of lumberjacks and fisher folk, canneries, sawmills and ships. Volcanic mountains and towering blue ice sculpt the wilderness of Glacier Bay, unspeakably pure and sublime. Juneau, a cosmopolitan capital paved with history. Haines is a haunt of eagles. And Skagway, the bawdy staging ground in the race for gold. Alaska's inside passage is huge. Astoundingly so, 10,000 miles of coastline, 10 million acres of forest, and a thousand islands. Ships have been plying these waters for over two centuries. In the 1880s, cruise ships carried sightseers up the passage to Glacier Bay. In the 1920s, ships embarked from Seattle for the 1,000 mile voyage. Notables have cruised these waters. Naturalist John Muir. Jack London, the novelist. Poet Robert Service. And James Mishner, who compressed the whole epic of Alaska into a thousand page novel. Why did they come? And why do they still come? for a sense of freedom that the place gives one. They come for a connection with this unconquerable wilderness. Yet, as human beings, we can destroy a wilderness such as this, but we can never conquer it. Misty Fjords National Monument is such a place, a wilderness as big as the state of Delaware. No roads mar this pristine preserve, 
If you're not on the water, it's a fly-in. Misty Fjords is a masterpiece, the planet's perfect fjordal system. Sheer rock walls sculpted by glaciers rising from 1,000 feet beneath the water's surface and soaring 3,000 feet into an infinity of mists and sky. cascade into the sea. Tour ships are skirting the steeps that dwarf them. Though we're at sea level, there's the feeling that we're cruising on an alpine lake on the roof of the world. Bears lumber easily along the shore, while eagles wheel at the cloud line. Bearded mountain goats clamber on the rocky heights. Perhaps a few who make this voyage come to feel a connection with every human being who ever came here before them, back to those first travelers over the land bridge. Tribes begotten by those bridge-crossing Adams and Eves planted themselves on the shores of this current warmed coast, the people of the totem. Their villages were rows of plank houses parallel to the beach. Some were 160 feet long and held several families. Totem poles fronted the houses and lined the beaches. No other native culture has created these stalwart sentinels other than these coastal tribes of northern Washington, British Columbia, and southeastern Alaska. Theirs was a culture remarkable for its art, for its social customs, for its know-how. They were the potlatch givers. Their pride was ever tested by the lavish giveaways of the potlatch feasts. They were the carvers of totem poles, records of family history and legends. These Indians dwelt in such harmony with their surroundings that they revered the spirits of those creatures that they fed upon, the halibut, the salmon. Then, interlopers, outsiders set in, like a swelling bellyache that wouldn't go away. Russians first, the Yanks next. There was no reverence for the spirits of the halibut and the salmon from those who were overfishing these waters. The outsider's diseases, smallpox, measles, the flu, reduced the Indian population by nearly two-thirds by the end of the 1800s. Their potlatches were discouraged, their art burned by those who declared it to be the work of savages, and their ears were plugged to the voices of the spirits. In today's Alaskan native, there's a resurging of pride in their native culture. This is evident in Ketchikan, the first stopover on an inside passage cruise. As many as five cruise ships tie up in a single day. The town's claim to the world's largest collection of totem poles is more than self-advertising, it's ever so visible. Natives turned away from pole carving, but totem poles were never meant to be monuments, and these originals rotted away. From nearby Klingit and Haida villages, some 33 specimens were saved and set up here at the Totem Heritage Center. A few miles south of town is Saxman Village, a safe keep of Klingit traditions. Each pole tells its story. Visiting William Seward, the U.S. Secretary of State for Abraham Lincoln, who had negotiated the Alaska Purchase, was guest of honor at a big bash that the Indians threw for him. Protocol demanded that he reciprocate by throwing a party for the Indians. Seward never responded, so his Indian guests carved this bear pole to make fun of his stinginess. 
here, Native American craftsmen are keeping alive the once suspect art of pole carving. They're teaching it to young artists who will carry on. North of town, more than a dozen poles stand among the trees of a forest glade in Totem Bight State Historical Park. Ancient Indian art reconstructed by modern public works, the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s. Though many of Alaska's Native Americans are programming themselves for the electronic age, they're still powered by their Indian past. That's what motivated Israel Shotridge to carve a replacement pole for the rotted out old Johnson pole that landmarked Ketchikan's downtown. Guiding his modern interpretation is a first edition Indian storybook that stood for a century. Alaska's so big that it can't help being boastful and Ketchikan is a virtuoso at blowing its own horn its boosters proclaim it the Gateway City and Alaska's first city, for it's the first stop cruising up the Inside Passage. Alaska's fourth largest city also calls itself the Rain Capital. True, the big rain gauge on the dock has recorded over 200 inches in a year, but there are other areas in Alaska that get more rain than that. It brags about being a fishing capital. Yes, at one time the catches were so big that they kept 12 canneries humming until the 1940s when overfishing killed the salmon runs. Today, fishing craft, commercial and sport, sally forth in search of Alaska's saltwater delicacies that abound in the bountiful waters around Ketchikan. Today it is the center of the lumber harvest from the Tongass National Forest. Proud Ketchikan is five miles long and two blocks wide. Many of its buildings and some of its roads are supported by pilings. During Prohibition, bootleggers hid from the feds among these pilings. Then at high tide, the booze was smuggled in through trap doors. Those trap doors were swinging and squeaking day and night here on Creek Street. This is Dolly's house. Dolly was queen of the red light district and with Ketchikan's propensity for bragging, her house was probably touted as the best in Alaska. Emptied of its human merchandise, it's furnished just as it was during Dolly's heyday. The result of a look but don't touch restoration. There's only one innovation, a cash register used in collecting entrance fees. Dolly would have approved. The red lights were shut off for good in 1954, but Dolly stayed on living on the premises until her death. From the wooden walks of Creek Street, you can still see salmon swimming past Dolly's house on their way up Ketchikan Creek. They used to say that both the salmon and the fishermen came up Creek Street to spawn. To this swell of mountains and glaciers and virgin forest of unnetted salmon and unmined gold and of beasts untrapped for their furs, this primeval Alaska sleeping its twilight sleep between the winters of long nights and summers of almost endless sun came ships, ships with white sails. And tales told on the totem poles were changed forever. Russia, holy, holy mother Russia. To the European high rollers, a Johnny come lately in the gamble for empire until Peter, Peter the Tall, Peter the Giant, Peter the Shipwright, Peter the Tsar and little father of all the Russias whom history calls the Great. He was the architect of a new Russia. 250 years ago, he commissioned a Dane to set out with ships. His name, Vitus Bering. In 1741, after two voyages in 16 frustrating years, Bering reached Alaska. 
On the way back, he was shipwrecked, and he perished with 31 others. But the survivors who managed to struggle back to St. Petersburg gave breathless accounts of the pelts they had seen. Pelts of a fur deeper, more durable, and beautiful than any ever worn in the courts of Europe. The winning combination had come up in Russia's gamble for wealth and empire. It was sea otter and Alaska. A Russian-American company was chartered in 1799 to ensure an orderly flow of profits to the mother country. It was governed by Alexander Buranov, tough, smart, decisive, a born leader. When he sailed his ships into the area of volcanic Mount Edgecombe, quite probably his policy was to exploit the native Indians and plant Holy Russia where they'd been. Why not? It had proved successful for Spain and for England. Today, his former capital, New Archangel, is the city of Sitka. When Los Angeles was no more than a dusty little mission, Sitka was a bustling trade center, its commercial enterprise reaching south as far as Fort Ross in California and west to the Sandwich Islands, now called Hawaii. Under Baranoff, the colony flourished, but not without struggle. Angry Indians destroyed his first settlement of Redoubt St. Michael. Later, in this totem-populated forest, now part of Sitka National Historic Park, booming Russian cannons blasted the Sitka Tlingits in a bloody battle. Unbowed, the Tlingits withdrew when they ran out of bullets. When the Indians returned 20 years later, they found that Baranov had built sturdy blockhouses to separate Russian from Indian settlements. What Baranov may have come to realize only tardily is that the barriers that kept the Indians out kept the Russians in. Fortunately, Russian imperialists failed to stifle the cultural urges in the native Klingits. Today, artists of the Alaska Native Brotherhood keep in sharp employ the skills of their forebears at Sitka's National Historical Park, which renders the town's history as a vivid personal experience. Here at the Alaska Raptor Rehab Center at Sitka, battered eagles are given care. The bald eagle, a profile that graces the great seal of the United States of America, was hunted until statehood. Bounty hunters slaughtered 128,000. Now protected, injured eagles are nursed back to health and let loose. Others, too badly crippled, are cared for until they die. These are college grounds, a college named for Sheldon Jackson, who was a far-sighted educational pioneer. During his lifetime, Jackson collected artifacts, ethnic treasures, really, that offer us deep insights into the native cultures of Alaska. They're on view here in the museum. James Mishner lived at the Jackson College while he wrote most of his bestseller on Alaska. Mishner didn't retire in Alaska, but many do. Men and women over 65 who resided in Alaska for no less than 15 years are entitled to full care, subsidized care, in a well-run retirement home. Here they're called pioneer homes. The first pioneer home in the state was built in Sitka. This is the site of Governor Baranoff's castle. These cannon go back to his time. Here from the polar north of a new continent, on a fringe of land lacing an ice blue sea, stand churches which are the farthest reach of Christian orthodoxy, pioneered by Russian priests wearing boots under their cassocks. In its cathedral, named for that sword-wielding archangel Michael, Sitka's Russian past vibrates with life. This is no penny ticket souvenir stand museum. This is a working cathedral, seat of a bishop who is a successor of Christ's apostles and the hub of a network of town parishes and backwoods churches and seminaries 
for the training of priests. In 1966, it burned to the ground and in rebuilding, rose from its ashes in reverent exactitude. Icons glow in candlelight and sonorous chanting mixes with the wafting of incense. In Alaska, the faith of old Russia rooted deeply in a soil spiked with totem poles. In defiance of Russian exploiters, Russian missionaries were compassionate. They liked the Indians. There are four Alaskan saints in the Orthodox Church. One of them, Peter the Aleut, is a Native American. An Orthodox service in Alaska and a service in the Soviet Union are almost identical. Singing is in Old Slavonic. But in Alaska, the language of worship may be English, Eskimo, Klingit, or Aleut. The builder of Sitka's cathedral between 1844 and 1848 was one of Alaska's four saints. He'd come from Russia to Alaska in 1823. Here you can visit his house. Father Vienyaminov was a brilliant priest, something of an architect, a carpenter, a clockmaker, and a student of natural science. Transporting himself by kayak, dog sled, and sometimes just his two cold feet, he brought over 10,000 Indians into the faith, and he formulated a Tlingit alphabet into which he translated the Gospels. When he was made the Bishop of Alaska, he was renamed Innocent. Later, he was elevated to Metropolitan of Moscow. Canonized in 1977, he is now known as Saint Innocent. Not all of Sitka's Russian heritage sounds like liturgical chanting. This new archangel group is keeping alive the folk heritage. Like vodka, their dancing has a Russian kick. After Imperial Russia lost interest, it sold Alaska to the United States for $7.2 million, only two pennies an acre. In 1867, Russian America became American Alaska. Seward's Folly, a worthless ice box Americans kept hooting until gold was discovered. Then the hoots became cheers. Forceful Russian rule was replaced by American lassitude. Alaska wasn't a state. Alaska wasn't a territory. They couldn't govern well what they couldn't legally define. The transfer from Russian to American ownership took place on this hill. It is celebrated here in October on Alaska Day. Petersburg. On these shores, with a nostalgia for his native fjords, a tough Norwegian cornerstoned a town. It rose to become Alaska's little Norway. This is a bear hug of a town, no show and tell tourist stop. It's a home to real Alaskans, fishermen, loggers, bush pilots.
Clawson Museum is like the town's family attic, barnacled crab pots, antiquated canning equipment and frayed fish nets, evoking memories of the old country. Fisk, Norwegian for fish, is emblematic of the town. The facades of these tidy houses offer colorful clues, a touch of folk art here and there, to the warm ties to Scandinavia glowing on the inside. Peter Bushman, the founder, who gave the town his first name, chose this spot for fish processing because of an abundance of fisk, salmon and halibut, and a ready supply of ice from a nearby glacier. It was 1912 when the first nails were driven into the Sons of Norway Hall. Norse descendants of Peter and his pioneers are still wrestling Alaska's silvery treasure from the sea. Cheek by jowl, rigging to rigging, they line the waterfront. Working boats, new and old, leaky saners, modern trawlers, well-used gill netters. Now they're waiting for the season. When it comes, these boats stretch over the water in long lines, heading for the open sea. Fishermen savor their freedom. Vacuums draw the catch up from the holds to a conveyor belt. There's no wasted motion. Fresh is best. In Peter's day, staggering numbers of salmon swarmed instinctively upstream to spawn. Now, after decades of overfishing, there are hatcheries to help keep the salmon run strong. Alaska is still a fisherman's heaven. Locals say there are halibut so big that it looks as though the sea's bottom were coming up to greet you. Catches of 30, 60, 100 pounds are common. The record? A whopping 371 pounds. These are the sort of diggings that sports fishermen from the lower 48 are booked into. Rustic looking, yes, but luxurious. They're a far cry from the crowded, smoky, communal dwellings of the Native Americans, like this early tribal house in Wrangell. A narrow footpath leads to an island named for Chief Shakes, who once led the Stikine Indians, and to the tribal house of Chief Shakes himself, guarded by a stand of old totems. In Alaska's rough and tumble history, Wrangell gets a chapter for hosting three gold rushes and for being the only town in the state over which three national flags have flown, Tsarist Russias, the Union Jack, and the Stars and Stripes. Long before flags, on Petroglyph Beach, some 9,000 years ago, wanderers incised their doodlings of fish and faces onto rocks. Other rocks, tiny ones. Sparkle the dreams of college for Wrangell's youth. At the ferry terminal there are garnets for sale. Garnets from a mine that was a gift to the Boy Scouts. The kids meet every boat that comes in. It's the first step toward college prep. The only road up here is a wet one, the Marine Highway. A fleet, affectionately dubbed the Blue Canoes, plies these waters the year round. Stateroom comforts are okay for tourists, but hardy Alaskans, most of them, curl up in the lounge or sleep on deck under the open sky. For them, it's camping at sea. The 400-foot Columbia, flagship of the fleet, shuttles the thousand miles from Washington to Skagway and back each week. It's one of the longest ferry runs in the world. Tongass is the largest national forest in the U.S. The cool, moisture-laden southeast is ideal for these lush forests. Chainsaws cutting swaths across the thick trees for pulp. This is a forest in transition. 
Because it's a protected wilderness, a third of this land will never be cut. Fortress of the Bears is what Admiralty Island National Monument is called. Edging these deep forest trails is the world's largest land carnivore, the 1,200-pound coastal brown bear. First choice for a meal, salmon. Sea lions silently cruise the shoreline. In isolated spots, undisturbed by man, rookeries reverberate to the sound of thousands of mothers fighting, birthing. Reminders of the timelessness of nature a vastness only found in Alaska. white and blue, of timeless waters and ancient ice which the Indians hailed as Thunder Bay because of the shattering sounds made by the calving glaciers. But this was not a bay two centuries ago. It was a vastness still locked within an ice age prison. Then the brittle lock cracked. Out of great valleys, out of the immense inlets, they withdrew back to their mountain home. It was a glacial retreat unparalleled in recorded history. Ice fronts of tidewater glaciers those that reach the ocean, are nearly a mile across and soar 150 feet from the waterline. What the Klingons called Thunder Bay, we speak of in awe as Glacier Bay National Park. In the later 19th century, naturalist John Muir, founder of the Sierra Club, had traveled to Alaska to confirm his theories on the geological origins of Yosemite. In his quest, Muir paddled 250 miles from Wrangell to the fabled Ice Bay, some 80 years after Captain George Vancouver, the English explorer, had come across it in 1794, when a huge glacier still blocked the bay's entrance. Muir entered the bay. He paddled some 30 miles before seeing his first glacier. After mooring his canoe, he climbed to the heights of a mountain and surveyed the scene before him. A solitude of ice and snow and newborn rocks, dim, mysterious. Muir's journey was epic. His published writings on it helped popularize the area. In the 1880s, steamships cruised the bay, forerunners of today's cruise ships.
Glacier Bay was declared a national monument in 1923 and gazetted as a park in 1982. The cruise ships plying the waters of Glacier Bay today bear little resemblance to those early steamships. But not all explorers of Glacier Bay come by cruise ship, for a daily excursion by smaller ships is available from the lodge at Bartlett Cove. or for the hardy adventurer who wishes to recapture those days of John Muir, a kayak trip up the bay to the still thundering tidewater ice fronts. Scientists marvel at how rapidly forms of life recolonize the land after glaciers have retreated. For thousands of years, this earth had been entombed in ice. Now, fireweed roots in its soil. Salmon are spawning in streams after 3,000 ice-blocked years. Abundant sea fowl nest in the leaves of crags once hostile to any form of life. And precariously perched on sheer cliffside, the kittiwakes stubbornly raise their young. Over 200 of southern Alaska's 278 species are found here in Glacier Bay. Some smacking of the Arctic, terns, puffins, oyster catchers, growth is explosive in the 18 hours of daily sunlight during summer. Life flourishes, as tiny as the sea's shrimp-like krill, one important food source for the sea's most massive mammal, the whale. This species is sometimes called the singing whale, because this 50-ton performer is a singer of plaintive songs. When this huge leviathan dives, they grow up to 50 feet long. The pronounced arching of its spine has earned it the name humpback whale. In winter, their songs resound over the coral seas of Hawaii, where they calve their young. Then, a 3,000-mile migration to Alaskan waters, where they feed on plankton in abundance. A full-grown humpback eats up to 4,400 pounds of food a day. Whales are smart. With bubbles they blow, they're able to form a wall-like circle which traps the krill. Then they surface and feast. In our day, there's a growing appreciation of whales, their intelligence, their playfulness. Not so in times past. Whales were stalked for oil, for baleen. In waters, the humpback was hunted mercilessly. It yielded the most oil for its size. Now the humpback can frolic again and increase because since 1967 they've been protected by law. The 
experience of Glacier Bay, the humpback, the majestic eagle in flight, the roars and thrusts of glacial ice is awesome, almost unbelievable. It's like reliving the Earth's diary. Ninety miles away, we're rested from geological time and placed smack in the 20th century. This is Juno. Clinging to the mountains alongside Gastineau Channel, there are no motorways to Juneau. Only access is by ship or plane. But once you're here, you're aware of being in the state capital. More than half the people who live here work for the government, federal and state. Here is a town that invites strolling. A town with sites that preserve each phase of the state's rambunctious history. In the hills that flank downtown, Alaska's U.S. statehood is landmarked by the governor's mansion. Home of Alaska's first federal judge, the House of Wickersham recalls the U.S. territorial period in Alaska. Here's a replica of a log church, a proud reminder of the pioneer era. St. Nicholas Russian Orthodox Church makes the state's Russian heritage one of the sites. Building began in 1894, nearly 30 years after Russia sold Alaska to the U.S. The church still serves a congregation. It's the oldest standing original Russian Orthodox Church in Southeast Alaska. Exhibits tracing the state's history are displayed at the Alaska State Museum. Going back farther than the Indians is going back to the land at its beginning. This is Juneau's magnificent backyard. It's the town's central park and picnic grounds. But one can't get there in the family car. Juneau's outskirts invite adventure. You need a boat, plane, or a helicopter. By air, Juno's outback offers indescribable adventures. Skirting the narrow fjords, the plains climb until they cross a high ridge. And then, stretching out before the plain, the overwhelming 1,500 square mile panorama of the Juno ice field. The snow falling here in one year would cover a 10-story building. This ice field, one of the largest in Alaska, pushes out 38 major glaciers. A frozen wilderness covered by a blanket of ice hundreds of feet deep. A reminder of when North America was smothered by sheets of ice miles deep. Mendenhall Glacier, just 13 miles from downtown Juneau, is granulating everything in its path as it creeps slowly but continuously toward the sea. 
The towering face of Juno's drive-up glacier is about a mile from the end of the road. Mendenhall is beautiful. If you're traveling by helicopter, you can land on Mendenhall and stretch your legs on a moving river of ice over 200 years old. In fact, you might see the elusive ice worm, about the size of an earthworm. They live near the surface of the glacier, feeding on algae. A glacier is alive with activity. Jagged chunks of ice the size of huge boulders tumble down ice faces. The churning, rugged Mendenhall River offers a wild ride to the sea. But for thrills, without the drenching, there's a trip to Tracy Arm, 60 miles south of the city. Traveling down the long canyons with massive, sheer granite cliffs rising thousands of feet, one retraces glacial history. Here, on icy beds of the glacial front, hair seals give birth. They're safe here from their perennial enemy, the orca whale. There are other dangers for boaters as well as for seals. A rolling iceberg, for example, three-fourths of an iceberg lurks underwater. One uneven melting causes the berg to bob and roll recklessly. That makes waves, enormous, life-threatening waves. Juno is more than the icy playgrounds of its backyard glaciers. Juno's founded on gold. When you're strolling in Juno, you're walking on gold. Acres of it, the whole city is built on huge tailings from gold mines. Town folk joke about panning for gold in their basements. In 1880, Joe Juno was first to find gold here. In time, the mines of Juno and of Douglas across the channel were among the biggest in North America. Ore was transported right through a mountain and stamped at this mill, now a ruins jutting over the waterfront. Though the old ore cars stand rusting in Juno's liquid sunshine, there's still a bonanza of gold in the mineral veins. The capital's population swells with the arrival of every cruise ship. Today's travelers, about a hundred years too late to join the gold rush, try their hands at panning at the last chance basin. Juno's active gold mine is its 24 karat tourism. Gold fever is almost as catching as the common cold. Those visitors who catch it push on to Skagway, a gateway to the Klondike, for a reliving of Alaska's great late 19th century adventure. For excursions to and from Skagway, they can board the old Steam Hall train, which has been in operation since 1898. Crossing the White Pass through the mile-high coastal range, the scenery is awesome. Also crossing the White Pass, running parallel to the railroad tracks, is the Klondike Highway. 
It was this highway that shoved the railroad out of top place in commercial transport to the Yukon. The White Pass and Yukon Route Depot, once the heartbeat of old Skagway. The National Park Service has carefully restored it. Now it serves as a visitor's center. Skagway remains what it's been since the gold rush, a reachable gateway to the Yukon. The intrepid visitor, more greedy for adventure than for gold, hikes down Skagway's Broadway for the first time. Everything's as it was. Horse and buggies, lodgings, eateries and stores selling gear for gold seekers, all restored. Either it's a back lot of a Hollywood film studio or it's the real thing. To today's enthusiastic visitors, it's the real thing. You can check in at the Golden North with its landmark Onion Dome. This 1898 hotel is the oldest still operating in the state. Then if you're hankering for a little refreshment, you can stumble into one of the last remaining of Skagway's 80 saloons, the Red Onion. For a little entertainment, it's down the street to the days of 98 Frolic. This historic building is the Arctic Brotherhood Hall, with 20,000 pieces of driftwood ornamenting its facade. But brotherhood isn't exactly what was brought out of folks yearning for gold. Lawless Skagway was a free-for-all. Rip-offs, cutthroats, shootouts. Graves were dug here, not gold. It was with prayers of thanksgiving that the dirt was shoveled over Jefferson Randolph Smith, alias Soapy Smith. He robbed and cheated the miners. He was an ornery leader of ornery men. Soapy was a bad guy. Frank Reed was a good guy. He and Soapy killed each other in a shootout on the wharf. Bystanders erected this monument to Frank in appreciation. How could such things come to pass in a sweet little town like Skagway? That noble yellow metal, impervious to the ravages of time. Gold, gold in the Klondike, rang throughout North America like a five alarm fire. In the summer of 1897, a flotilla of ships, creaking dangerously from overloads of passengers, steamed for Alaska. They say that a million planned to go, that a hundred thousand set off, and the 25,000 who made it were all certain that they'd come back rich. They were nicknamed the Stampeders. Overnight, Skagway mushroomed from a tent settlement to a rip-roaring frontier town. So did its little sister city and biggest rival, Dai. Nine miles from Skagway, where mud flats edge the Lynn Canal, and fields of iris bloom, there's another settlement, a rival gateway to the Yukon. Dai's boom matched Skagway's. Eager seekers queued up and headed for the gold fields over the Chilkoot Pass. It was the shortest way, but fraught with danger. Some didn't make it. On Palm Sunday, 1898, there was an avalanche on the trail. 200 men and women were buried by it. 60 perished. Adventure seekers can trod in the steps of those gold-seeking stampeders, passing rusting bits of the gear they jettisoned along the way on the Chilkoot Trail. Even in summer, climbing this slope to the summit is punishing. The trail cuts through Klondike Gold Rush National Historical Park, an international park, partly in Canada and partly in the USA. Hiking the 33 miles from Dai to Lake Bennett takes from three to six days. In the fierce winter of 1897, it was a frozen hell. Over 70 feet of snow fell that year. But the Stampeders kept slogging, relaying supplies in 50 to 100 pound loads to make up the full ton required of each of them 
by the Mounties on the Canadian side. Some plotted over a thousand miles before reaching Lake Bennett. It was surreal, like fly specks on a wall of ice, multitudes in file fighting for each breath of thin air. If your muscles cramped, jerking you out of line for a moment, it took long, bitter hours to force your way back into this chilkoot lockstep. Yet each slogger was telling himself that this was the golden stairs to riches. Surmounting the Chilkoot Pass was not the end. The Klondike gold fields were still 560 miles away in Canada. Access to these fabled fields was in the currents of the Yukon, but the river was frozen solid. So these stampeders raised a tent town at Lake Bennett and waited for the thaw. They weren't idle. Hillsides were stripped of timber for boat building. They even built a church, but it never heard a hymn sung or a sermon preached. Spring came and the river ran free. The way was open to the gold fields. In May, over 7,000 boats set off on the last leg, a strange flotilla of river craft has never again been seen. Some were jerry-built, and some were seaworthy. Some were wrecked in the turbulent rapids here at Miles Canyon on the way to the end of the trail. Dawson. Dawson was to Canada what Skagway was to Alaska. Today it's being so lovingly restored to the look of its gold rush past that it's a step back into the 19th century. For the ones who made it, Dawson was the end of the trail. Dawson was their El Dorado. The gold, the noble, holy gold of their dreams, they were too late. Those who'd arrived before the Stampeders of 98 got the gold. The early birds went home millionaires. Now, all the gold claims were staked. The Stampeders were stunned. Some gave up. Some got drunk and stayed drunk for the rest of their lives. The strong ones turned around and started for home. They went for broke. Broke is what they got. It's possible that some of the disillusioned stampeders followed another trail to the Klondike, the Dalton Trail, out of Haines, 13 miles from Skagway, and one of the few towns in southeastern Alaska accessible by road. is a town sheltered by the Chilkat Mountains with Lynn Canal, the longest glacial fjord in Alaska at its waterfront. Some of its newer buildings are old. Victorian, Fort Seward, while some of its older buildings are new, reconstructions of time-honored Indian dwellings. Most of the gold seekers who came here never got rich. What they could find here, if they sought it deeply enough, was a richer life. In this sense, Haynes is Alaska's true gold. In its quiet way, Haynes exemplifies the more abundant life that Alaska offered and still offers. Haines is community, whole, organic, rooted in the Native American soil. Mythical spirits of the first inhabitants here, wind and sun, eagle and trickster raven, they're a part of community.
artists, of whom Haynes boasts many, working in wood, in silver, mine those Indian myths for inspiration. Here, each person is his own man or woman. Individualism counts. The old frontier virtues that made the American nation of an ocean-to-ocean -ocean wilderness. Self-reliance, hard work, and the sharing of fulfillments with your neighbors are part of everyday living. And here there may be numbered among those virtues a profound respect for wildlife. Bald eagles abound in this area. During winter, when the rivers freeze, the waters here continue to flow in an open channel for late coming salmon. And the eagles come. Each year, over 2,000 sharp eyed eagles congregate at Haynes to feed. To some eagle watchers who witness it, the event is more than just unforgettable. It is a moment frozen in time where fact and symbol merge. A remarkable bird of prey, the emblem of a great nation, in its freedom of flight and independence, reflects the spirit of Alaska and its inside passage. <laughs> 